Welcome to this presentation about the ECB and the ghost of Bolshevism. I'll take you to a walk through the history of the USSR central banking system and the planned economy or the command economy that comes along with it. Collectivism to post-scarcity, um, to better understand the function of the Gos Bank and the view on money within the USSR, we also need to uh, look at what they believed in. Um, so this uh, underlying ideology. And uh, of course, they stemmed from a, a Marxist vision on post-scarcity and the abundance as an end phase. So they believed or they had the dream that the Soviet world, as they saw it, which was worldwide, would eventually end in a sort of plant and command economy where socialism and collectivism would rule the world and be abundant. And um, in that sort of uh, society, they believed to have uh, no scarcity at all and no, um, let's say, parasitic systems that would um, compromise their um, future. So they uh, this was done and um, this was done actually to, to through a series of reforms and this was uh, also um, the goal to be done with the classes on itself they see a society within um, the old realm or the um, the old imperialism as different classes of people and uh, they wanted to get rid of that to have a sort of equilibrium not profit. That was the theory, of course. So um, collectivism to post-scarcity is actually a goal to uh, aim for a classless, moneyless and stateless society in the end stage, which is uh, rather funny because yeah, a stateless society is, of course, um, not achieved immediately. So they needed to get uh, some in-between steps uh, to achieve that. Um, read the Soviet Union and so on. So this, um, uh, they aimed, of course, to destroy the capitalist class as um, as the first they wanted to get rid of um, in, for, in favor of the working class. We must uh, also uh, look at this from a perspective of that society in those times. Uh, there were a lot of real workers, uh, people who worked uh, the land, mined, um, resources and also worked in factories and so on. So this, um, this, this top class was actually for them a profit-oriented influence and this uh, needed to be gone after a while for them. So uh, they saw it as people who just hoarded and uh, hoarded goods and uh, were busy with price gogging and so on. So the, the, they wanted to achieve this rather fast, um, therefore they, uh, they instigated this revolution and most uh, Bolsheviks and most uh, real um, communists want to achieve this in various degrees of uh, speed, let's say. So money as we know it now in the fiat system was their enemy as well. So it was just a necessary evil, a temporary tr transition, nothing more, as just a phase, which is something we have in common as Bitcoiners with the Bolsheviks, actually, uh, be it for, of course, totally different reasons and totally different end goals. We want uh, freedom, we want uh, individual Individuality and uh, profit and value, but um, they want a sort of worldwide prison command like system. So, being conscious about these classes of people um, is very important within socialism and communism, actually. So, um, this um, this old poster depicts it uh, very well. It's uh, actually uh, showing what they, uh, what the, their society or their view on society looked like. Uh, at the bottom, we bottom we have the miners and the soldiers, and uh, people who work the land and so on. People who work in a factory, and uh, there above we have the clergy and the the, the higher clergy. The, the, the kings and the rulers and so on. And at the, at the very top, there is a sort of yeah, emperor or whatever you want to call it. Uh, in, their, in their form, it was the Tsars, of course. So this, uh, the, yeah, the, the, they saw it as a, a sort of people power versus the fans of landlords. And uh, 
be it again, this is for different reasons as we see it as the Bitcoin class and the fiat class people or the proof of work people and the proof of stake people. But uh, we don't see it in these kinds of classes. We see it uh, actually as something where you produce something and where you work for something and then you um, receive rewards for that. The fiat system is rotten, we know it, and it enslaves us all, but um, the Bolsheviks already knew that. Of course, they aimed at the wrong enemies, not the fiat system itself, but okay, not indirectly uh, as such. So um, here's a nice quote from Lenin himself from State and Revolution. It's more pleasant and useful to go through the experience of a revolution than to write about it. The word Bolshevik, then, it's not uh, to be mistaken for this wrestling tag team by the same name uh, depicted in uh, this uh, nice photo. Uh, the word Bolshevik came from the word majority or one of the majority. Um, while Lenin's side only had a majority for only a few days, actually, in history, but they called themselves the majority anyway. Um, yeah, there, there was a sort of rivalry, to say, uh, <laughs> to say it mildly, with the Mensheviks, which were the minority, and the social revolutionaries. Um, so uh, it was more of a, an internal propaganda war where uh, different sides uh, during the, the, the time up to the revolution rivaled with each other for various uh, reasons. So where did all this come from? The word Bolshevik actually means the majority, but um, they, they call themselves that because these, um, uh, these organizations also had a long-standing rivalry for other reasons. Uh, for example, there was some discussion about uh, one of the women who hanged herself uh, after being harassed and made fun of by the people in the party, and uh, from that stemmed a long uh, sort of rivalry. There, there were other reasons as well. Also, ideologically, they were uh, kind of different, um, meaning that they had different views on how to achieve this revolution and also how to um, steer the people. Like, um, you couldn't take any factory worker and say, okay, now you are in charge. They saw themselves as the more elite, the more intellectually um, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, capable people to steer that revolution. But not all of them had this viewpoint. So if, if you talk like to 20 communists, you will see four or five different viewpoints on how to achieve the revolution. This, um, this timeline is also uh, important to understand where the... Uh, the Gauss Bank comes from. So uh, early communism to Marxism, it's about in the 1840s. Russian groups assassinated Alexander II. Um, that was in 1881. And then the People's Will, this was actually a socialist terrorist uh, organization or liberators as they called themselves. And they tried to assassinate the son of Alexander II, Alexander III, and they failed. Um, this was actually done by Lenin's brother, and he was uh, executed for that. The Bolsheviks, with uh, well, uh, Vladimir Lenin's uh, uh, organization, uh, conducted a bank robbery in 1907 in the Irvansky Square uh, to get funds for their, uh, let's say, little political project. And uh, 35 people were killed in that attack, more or less, and the funds stolen were um, actually used to fund their operation. But they all went to jail. Uh, then the troubles uh, started with World War One, or the, uh, the 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 time towards uh, World War One, actually, and um, it started to um, uh, for Russia. I mean, uh, it started to destabilize Russia. Uh, there were a lot of strikes, hunger strikes, and so on. So um, for us, the World War One area was already ongoing back then. But these guys were in jail uh, during that. Uh, that time. In 1917, there was the February Revolt, and then the 1917 October Revolution, which is actually uh, when the Bolsheviks took power. This is just a, a rough timeline. Uh, this is, of course, um, yeah, uh, more detailed in reality, but just to get an idea. Um, this uh, timeline was also... Um, 
well, influenced by a temporary liberal government after the Tsar stepped down. And uh, that leader was Alexander Kerensky. And this man uh, continued the war efforts uh, during World War One for Russia. And that led to more uh, unease and political instability. And uh, on the day of the revolution, a series of miscommunications uh, put the power in the hands of the Bolsheviks, who were actually a, a very small group, but they were uh, tight-knit and they were really fast and well-organized, actually, and they were the only ones who decisively could act in those uh, daring times. So they took advantage of the... Um, let's say, disinterest of the average citizens who were just tired of uh, being hungry, being in that war and having really bad leadership. And during that time, the Bolsheviks, uh, well, took power. The Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, took government buildings at first and eventually took power uh, on uh, on the streets, actually, without too much of a fight. Um, it's always like this, this mythical battle, this revolution where many people died. That didn't happen on that day itself, in November 6th to 7th in 1917. Um, the, the bloodshed came uh, a bit afterwards. Um, so... Um, they, they took control of the Duma in Petrograd and then the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, there they opened a safe with secret documents to pressure other countries uh, because they had made secret treaties um, unbeknownst to each other, uh, of course, uh, with Russia. So, and then next they took the National Bank and destroyed uh, uh, a lot of wine bottles uh, stored there. Um, and of course, the best way to destroy a wine bottle is by drinking it or giving it away to any peasant that comes along. Then we have this uh, famous quote from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Actually, this came from August Becker in 1844, and it was uh, recycled by um, Karl Marx. Um, as they saw fiat money, uh, something presenting the old Tsar or imperialistic system, this class oppression, it meant to enslave people, it, and it still does, actually. Uh, fiat itself uh, is just a means of uh, pressuring people. And we see that in the Western world, we see that, or we saw that in the Soviet world and the Tsar and so on, uh, the Tsar's world and so on. So first, the Russian Soviet Federative uh, Socialist Republic would adopt socialism and a planned economy, making fiat money something more or less redundant. And um, moving on, spreading socialism, o socialism over the region and later the whole world. Uh, Lenin issued decrees, um, for example, on collectivizing some land um, and stopping the war effort without negotiation. He started to win people over with popular reforms and giving perks like self-determination of nations, bread supplies in cities, drinks, housing, and so on. So he, he realized that he could only push through his uh, really radical reforms by, well, giving the people drinks and food and some perks. It's important also to, to look at the timeline of the Russian National Bank, which comes into play here. Um, in, the beginning, in the beginning of the 1900s, the National Bank began to play the role of bank of last resorts, um, a last resort. Uh, they gave bailouts to local banks and other branches of their um, Palyakov group, and they would uh, go through a series of reforms anyway. And then in uh, 1897, the gold standard was introduced to fight inflation. 1905, the state bank could exchange gold for banknotes to cope with inflation and uh, the brewing revolution. You must see that uh, during that time, people really were hungry, inflation was rampant, and uh, people just sought, uh, sought out some, some ways to keep their money and keep their value. And when the Soviets took over, uh, the Bolsheviks um, were the main controlling group within the government, and they um, did away, of course, with that uh, bank in some way. We will see that uh, immediately. Uh, also important, uh, there were three brothers from a Polish Polish Jewish family um, who uh, were in charge of this uh, Polyakov Bank in Moscow, and um, this was actually the first com commercial bank there. Uh, in that, uh, during that time, in November 1917, the Bolsheviks took control of the state bank buildings as well, and the personnel largely went on strike in protest. So uh, this um, 
well, the communists actually uh, went in and uh, with their force and with their weapons, they inspected the vaults and uh, held, uh, well, which held a lot of valuables, of course. And um, yeah, some uh, valuables might be uh, accidentally misplaced uh, within uh, the party somewhere. Um a planning center was installed to actually start to implement the theory that they uh, wanted to implement to to have a command economy. And uh, under this new structure, this uh, Soviet state bank would control the money flows of other banks and companies and people. So um, this was uh, done very deliberately as a means of control to go to a classless society. If you take the... The, the control of the money, then it doesn't actually is well. It it, it stops being money actually, and it uh, becomes a sort of means of control. And their means of control was actually well taking it from the old imperialists, so to speak, and uh, moving it to a uh, sort of classless society. Again, this was their theory. Um, in uh, in essence, it went a bit different, of course. In uh, nineteen. 19- 18, the Soviet state bank reform continued and uh, they took sole monopoly, monopoly over the banking system in Russia, along with the rights to create, destroy and print banknotes. And their administration would be, uh, well, a way to log and safeguard and take care of the savings, valuables and so on. And this meant uh, gold, silver, diamonds, artwork and so on, uh, all became owner, owned by the state itself, forcing companies even to invest their valuables in that state system. So if you were a company during that time uh, who had, let's say, uh, three kilograms of gold in a vault anywhere, then you were actually forced to, quote unquote, invest that in the Soviet state system. Uh, 1920, during this year, all previous tasks of the commercial and national Russian bank would now be taken over by this newly created Soviet state bank named, um, yeah, I cannot pronounce it, but uh, I'll try, uh, Gosudarstveni Bank uh, SSSR, short, the Gosbank, and I will call it Gosbank just uh, for ease of pronunciation, uh, its headquarters in Moscow. So the bank was reformed and renamed a few times, officially uh, in 1921, 22, 23. Uh, If there's one thing uh, communists really like is uh, reforming and renaming stuff. So um, this was all, of course, quite questionable. Uh, Lenin himself described the bank in 1922 as a a potek, Potemkin village, a paper facade, uh, in one of his internal letters to the head of that bank. And uh, that man uh, didn't return to Moscow after uh, visiting London for some reason. Um, Yeah, I can understand that man. (laughs) Um, Okay, so this is a quote from uh, Lenin in that letter. A powerful apparatus, the powerful apparatus transferring from one state pocket into another such remarkable real values as Soviet rubles. Um, okay, Soviet blockchain has you stacked, um, you know, again, with a nice propaganda poster. So the basic idea for this mono bank came from a Swedish central bank system set up in the 17th century, which regulated state funds and tracked stocks, uh, Sveriges uh, Riksbank. Osferiges Riksbank, and um, it had almost uh, modern central bank powers and structure. And, uh, well, kudos to the Swedish to uh, to find this system and to implement it already in the 17th century. This was the uh, structure of uh, the uh, Soviet system, the Supreme Soviet and everything that's uh, underneath. And here you can see in red the structure of the um, state bank system under the Council of Ministers of the USSR. You can imagine that this is very rigid and, uh, well, administrative heavy and uh, politicized. The cost bank. Uh, so the USSR leadership saw banks as a means of production, just like a, a sawmill or a commercial bank or factories or land. So this uh, caused actually a means of production and it was weaponized. It was a weaponized bank account along with incentivized money, as they called it. Um, and it's it's much like what we see today in Europe, uh, where we see these bank accounts being used not as a means of holding 
cash or holding real money, but as a means of controlling people. The Ghost Bank was used from 1920 onwards as a means of production for their command economy. This is key. This is very important. Their whole system, their whole Ghost Bank system was not to have real money circulating or um, having people who could earn a living or could uh, make decisions for themselves or so what. It was a soulless administrative system uh, where money was not uh, to be and, and money was not there to be actually used as money, but as a means of control. This is key. This is um, very important. The Soviet uses our economic policy in the timeline is also important. Uh, from uh, 1918 to 20, uh, we saw war communism with directive planning. Um, then we saw the uh, NEP, market economy. Trotsky was against it, Stalin was indifferent, and Lenin was uh, for. Um, we will see about that uh, in a moment. And then we had this, um, well, the rest was actually filled with the 1929 to 1991, the command economy, and then from 1992 onwards, the market economy, or what should be the market economy. This NEP was the new economic policy um, after very high inflation, um, reminds us of something, <laughs> uh, after very high inflation and uh, war reparations for uh, decades, the new economic policy was running between uh, 1921 and 1928. And during a five-year reform plan um, created by the USSR leadership, they um, they actually were uh, on the well on a planning to get this new sort of economy going. Um, Soviets worked in five year reform plans, and uh, each five year was actually an, uh, a sort of era uh, where they uh, just went on to um, implement their plans. Um, this all came to be at, after the Kronstadt rebellion, uh, where uh, sailors turned act turned actually against the Bolsheviks because of shortages. And of course, they uh, took control by force. And uh, yeah, eventually they um, killed or deported all the people who uh, who came up and rose up against that system. But they, uh, the leadership understood that these sort, of rebellions, these sort of rebellions wouldn't stop and wouldn't uh, be easy to be... Um, dealt with in the future if they kept going. So they actually invented this new economic policy to stem that. So the Ghost Bank would also the Ghost Bank would also play a role in this, giving out loans to good citizens and smaller operations and businesses before 1928. So to keep them calm, they printed money and they well just um, spread it out over their friends and their friendly businesses, everything that kept people uh, happy enough. Uh, the reform would leave the war communism economy and build a command economy as such. Uh, this is this is actually important between those two eras. This uh, new economic policy would also end when Stalin came to power, uh, ending a lot of things actually uh, when he came to power. With the original Bolsheviks, um, they wanted to continue with that, but uh, Stalin wanted to do it even faster and wanted to to put an end to these shortages by collectivizing farms and land even further and faster. Uh, Stalin was someone who wanted to go through uh, reforms really rapidly and um, in a way that he um, deemed it necessary and not necessary uh, building on what was uh, planned before. The NEP was successful from an economic standpoint. So when we hear about the Soviet Union, we also think on uh, long bread lines, people queuing up, people uh, starving and so on. But actually, when you look at the early days of uh, their communist setup, uh, it was actually, um, well, thriving or even going uh, well. Um, so this is... Um, this is an, an initial uh, chart about um, those st statistics. And um, yeah, you, you see here a map between the official statistics and the alternative estimate afterwards. The annual growth, you see here that they actually achieved a lot of growth in the beginning. And then, yeah, it slowly uh, went downhill from there. Uh, the NEP, in my opinion, 
in the uh, ECB and the US Federal also want to mimic this uh, NEP program because it proved to be successful after a period of high inflation and chaos. Um, the quantitative easing after the financial crisis in 2009, for example, or the COVID era and the subsequent insertion of money into our system, uh, blank checks, bailouts, money printing and so on, all stands for this World War I uh, chaos. And it was all solved by this NEP by the Soviets. Uh, again, I want to stress that this was actually um, working in the beginning. Central planning. Uh, so this um, the cost bank had many functions. Central banking. I mean, um, at first they were of course a central mono bank, the only place to go when you uh, want to steer an economy and have a command economy and control. So of course they printed money. They also uh, led the uh, the administration for large transfers of funds, investing money and giving credit. And then they had a commercial banking task as well, aimed at smaller cooperatives, businesses, and even citizens uh, to settle payments and uh, operating local branches and so on. Um, this credit was actually also recalculated constantly to follow inflation and the labor market conditions, supply, and so on. So they, they had a very, very advanced way of planning their economy, uh, certainly, when you look at it from their perspective in that time, they didn't have uh, had AI data banks, uh, uh, databases, or um, uh, computers or whatever. They they had no modern means to do this, and yet they they um, achieved a very very advanced system to constantly monitor their uh, money printing and the real value that um, that went into and out of their fake economy, actually. Uh, well, fake, uh, steered economy and controlled economy. And this was recalculated constantly. Of course, uh, during the decades that followed, these recalculations became more... Um, uh, more or less less accurate because of corruption and so on, but also because of things that went wrong in the planning and couldn't be openly said and so on. But the um, the actual goods in stock, for example, were really counted and really taken into account uh, along with the number of people available for a task and the labor market conditions and so on. So they they really did a, a fine job of trying to make this command economy work. The ECB Gosbank crossover uh, will have a different uh, kind of approach. Uh, uh, we see all kinds of uh, names flowing around, but the um, the ECB and their ESG sort of uh, story is the new uh, utopia for me, uh, a sort of post-scarcity world imagined by the Bolsheviks, but this time we're in a different era, of course, and we all dream of a uh, sort of uh, green and sustainable criteria and they, uh, well, they invest in things like Samsung, Apple, Starbucks and so on, but also they play along in the narrative, just like the uh, one Soviet world dream was being uh, achieved. This Gosbank and this ECB, they are quite similar on uh, other levels as well. But this dream or this post-scarcity utopia they had is also available in our current system. Um, this is an, uh, a nice tree drawn from a or taken from a drawing in a uh, presentation from the Bank of International Settlement, and uh, this is also a nice parallel parallel between their uh, Gos Bank dream in the in the Soviet era and the current central bank money. Uh, you see here this uh, central bank money they invented, then a bunch of APIs, which is actually a bridge between uh, the money and databases and and it can uh, call functions from any kind of application let's say and then there is the private sector with all kinds of uh, gaming devices and um, healthcare and so on that is all uh, intertwined in a long tree so they uh, don't want to uh, be called a monobank or they don't want to be called uh, something centralized or soviet like but yet they draw a tree that is uh, very much alike uh, a monobank the Gosbank structure, which uh, where we see here a, a nice 
paper banknote from that era. The monobank in uh, the Gosbank era in the USSR had two layers, actually. One for big state-level uh, transactions, bigger transactions, all going through a ledger, which was just a map, just a book, where they kept the, um, the main, let's say, uh, transactions. And this was, uh, let's say, just a book where, uh, for example, one big state firm wanted to order 2,000 uh, steel plates, for example, and they needed to pay that. And this was all done not in cash, not in a real transfer, but just by a book. And someone, a bookkeeper, um, kept it and said, OK, they paid so much rubles for these 2,000 uh, steel plates and um, one part of the government paid another part of the government this uh, this way. Then you had a second layer, the smaller payments, and these were for, let's say, the peasants, the citizens, and the smaller um, cooperative structures or households. And um, this was actually done on purpose as a, a sort of means in between getting rid of money altogether. So this was a necessary evil for them. The cost bank layer one um, follows the output or the command plans, uh, one uh, for big state level or big transactions. So um, these were all non-cash and this existed only in the books as well. So it's not just that someone writes it in a book, it only existed in existed in that book, in that ledger. The Central Bureau in Gosbank accepted, approved, and broadcasted it in their bookkeeping, uh, much like Bitcoin does on the blockchain. So you actually, uh, but we have, of course, not... Um, uh, not the same way of working. Uh, in essence, we have Bitcoin underneath and yeah, you can count it. But um, they actually invented uh, the money needed and then they accepted it, they approved it, they wrote it, wrote it down and then they broadcasted it in their book bookkeeping. And this was not public, but for their Soviet representatives. And that's also important. Uh, this, this bookkeeping was kept on paper, of course. It was a ledger. It was quite advanced for that time, but it's, um, it's more or less yeah, inventing money just to keep your own structure working. Um, these funds didn't exist prior to transaction and were just minted or invented on the spot if deemed necessary, as explained. But also, it um, also had to fit in that five-year plan. So you had to have some sort of explanation why you wanted invent to invent those uh, funds. But if they were necessary and they fitted in the five-year plan, it was usually okay. Um, the other internal transactions went from one branch of the Gosbank to another, account to account, all done on the same ledger. So uh, this was actually a sort of settlement layer one, just like we have on Bitcoin, um, with the big difference that they could uh, invent as much uh, funds and rubles as they wanted, uh, which is, of course, not the case with Bitcoin, where we are capped at 21 million. Then we have the Gosbank Layer 2, or as I call it, PLEP Fiat. Um, and uh, this followed the labor plans in balance with price controls, supply of goods, and so on, um, as seen earlier. And these were smaller, less important important uh, payments because Lenin himself wanted to be lenient on free trade within the boundaries um, to some extent because it made the people happy enough to keep going. Um, if you worked in a factory and you had a small means of extra, well, not extra, uh, of, of cash that you could, let's say, um, use yourself at your own will, uh, then you were happier than you would than when you would have no money at all. So he realized that you have to have cash for those people in order to keep them happy enough. Um, central bank paper and coins were created uh, in a subdivision of the Gos Bank at first, and by 1932, all the old commercial activities were stopped. Um, money had also a, a sort of content of gold, which went down over time. Um, so the free movement of gold was also halted a few years after because of the economy was good enough to not rely on gold. Um, 
as you can imagine, the real gold in those coins went down over time as well as their economy well, kind of deteriorated and their plans uh, went on to get actually rid of money. And yeah, if you want to do that, it, there's no point of having real gold in your coins anymore because that holds real value and yeah, you could hoard that. And that's just what they didn't want. Um, this technology was lacking, of course, during that time to get this layer two um, passed through these central ledgers, just like happened on layer one. They actually wanted to do this eventually, but for smaller amounts, they, this made no sense and it was just not feasible at the time. They didn't have the tech, they didn't have computers to do that, and um, they... Well, they wanted to have some leeway to have people trade in between from person to person with cash just to keep them happy enough not to have big revolts and, well, just to have some kind of leeway for the people themselves. They really knew that if we take all the money away and put you in a complete control economy, there will be revolts. So they, well, they kind of tried to uh, stem that this way. They didn't have the tech to do it, simply put. And um, yeah, if you survived for working for Stalin, of course, uh, then you could see some uh, GDP increase uh, for the ones left. So you see the numbers here. The money supply went up uh, 300%, uh, by the way, in this, uh, this kind of way. Um, yeah, this is a fragment from the uh, excellent film, the, uh, the movie The Death of Stalin, and uh, where, well, uh, even leadership couldn't admit there was a problem anywhere. So they say, no problem. I mean, no problem. No problem. <laughs> Excellent movie. If you want to learn about how uh, communism failed and, and what kind of people were uh, um, forming that uh, society, it's, uh, it's of course, uh, Americanized. So it, it's not literally historically correct, I assume, but it's correct enough to have a good laugh at it. Then uh, Stroy Bank, uh, these were uh, also a part of this Goss Bank structure. Uh, they did large constructions and infrastructural works, and um, there were other banks as well. You see the names here, like the Sperbank and the Vnestor. Bank. Sperbank was the main savings bank where the workers could deposit their funds. If you had funds left over, you could save with the Soviet state bank. And uh, these funds were all direct loans to the state for infrastructure and weapons and so on. Um, and so on. Uh, so uh, those loans to the state were taken from these accounts as well, sometimes forced. So if you had a nice savings account at the Sperbank, and you um, yeah, one day wanted to get some funds out, it could be that the state just took a loan from your uh, savings account, which is not a savings account at all, of course. You just give your money away to a state system that uses it for whatever. Um, and these sa savings were a flow back to the state on the layer two level. So you uh, the, these expendable or extra coins, uh, people got the illusion that they could save, but actually they were... Uh, we're just uh, giving it back to the state in some form. Um, yeah, their their slogan was money should follow the plans. Again, uh, you see the Bolsheviks here and there you see <laughs> um, a wrestler with a lot of money. So um, yeah, it, that's the difference actually. You have a sort of freedom with people making money and fun and then you have the Bolsheviks. Uh, yeah, it's it may be a stupid an analogy, but uh, <laughs> hey... Uh, okay, so this Goss Bank parallel and the ECB parallel is maybe uh, interesting to see. Here you see the money supply in the Soviet Union at the end of uh, the year, every time um, in a uh, million current rubles. So here you, um, you see a nice, uh, nice dip here in the 60s, and then uh, they went up again with uh, a nice money supply increase. And then you have the same uh, for the ECB. Uh, European Central Bank, and uh, yeah, I think this uh, chart speaks for itself. And here is the M2 money supply of the Gas Bank uh, of the uh, European Central Bank. Yeah, it's difficult to keep them apart. Then we uh, we arrive at the CBDC, digital euro. 
Um, there are some parallels here as well. As you all know, uh, probably the ECB plans to implement a uh, total control coin, which is the CBDC or digital euro, capped at uh, 1.5 trillion euro in digital circulation. This is akin to the PLEP fiat or the layer two of the cost bank. Layer one is a centralized uh, ECB system where everything, everything passes through them. Of course, they have the means like um, databases and computers and so on to do this um, in, in contrast to what the Soviets had to do on paper. Uh, even internationally, they have this ready with the MCBDC, which are br bridges uh, between the different systems. For example, if South Africa and Japan have a CBDC as well, they can interact uh, on this MCBDC layer uh, worldwide. So uh, the Bank of International Settlements is uh, really, um, well, creating a sort of uh, one world coin. The ECB's permission uh, is necessary. So this is also a parallel where the Soviets uh, administered this layer one ledger. The ECB will also have uh, to, uh, well, okay something when you uh, transact with the digital euro or on their layer one. And um, this uh, will actually do what the Soviets dreamed about all along with the necessary uh, evil of having money for a while until it's no longer necessary. And they also have the tech to do it, apparently. So also the ECB claims the CBDC is an exact e equivalent for euro cash as we uh, now know it. And it's only the digital version of it. At least that's what they, uh, they tell you in the marketing. Um, in fact, it's the opposite. It's not a euro at all, as it plays by different rules, all going through a layer one style ghost bank system. So if I give you a uh, paper note, uh, euro, let's say I give you 20 euros on paper, then you can do with it whatever you want and go to a shop and pay with it and so on. If I give you a digital 20 euro bill, only digital, then you don't know if you can still use it tomorrow because they can just cancel it or uh, do whatever with it, uh, put uh, an expiry date on it or... Um, well, take it. So just like the Soviets, they can just, uh, well, take your money from the spare bank. Then you have the flooding the market with inflation through money printing. This was actually at 1.600% in the USSR. And, um, well, the CBDC does in fact the same. They, uh, they put uh, a lot of inflation and a lot of money printing in motion. And now... Uh, we saw some uh, inflation going on, not 600%, of course, but, uh, well, high enough. We're not used to that kind of uh, figures, 10% and so on. So um, rolling out the CBDC under stable conditions is necessary, just like the USSR did with the ruble. But um, it's also like uh, a, a political means. So if it's unstable enough, then they can introduce it as a sort of a savings or a sort of savior. And if it's really stable, they can introduce it as well. So, um, yeah, the the head of the uh, CBDC group in the European Commission, um, I think Pablo Panetta, or uh, one of those guys said in an interview that they only need to have uh, the euro stable for about two years to, um, uh, to roll out the CBDC. And then the maximum cap per person would be around 3,000 euros. Um, and yeah, that's for me the definition of programmable money. Um, they also mimic the current cash society and replacing it slowly or but surely. And uh, eventually they will not do this on a voluntary basis as they will do in, in the beginning, of course, but they will uh, force that uh, along the way. The 1925 style sort of price regulation to mimic the industrial oversupply in the USSR will also be mimicked. Behavioral nudging is going on rampantly at the moment through weaponized bank accounts uh, and apps. See the Kate coin experiment by the uh, R3 corporate blockchain by a bank called KBC. But that's just one example. There are many other examples where you can see uh, nudging going on or even the Payconic uh, payment system in Belgium that uh, rejected some uh, someone from using their system because they had uh, the wrong political view and so on. Um, it will be uh, weaponized just, uh, well, if, if the ECB rolls out 
a sort of app to um, uh, to mimic a bank account, it will be, in essence, a total control coin, just like the ruble was under the Soviet Union. Only this time you don't have books or you don't have a sort of ledger that had to be transported from one branch to another physically, but you have it just uh, on an app and on a database within a network or a blockchain. Uh, in effect, it makes it possible to turn your money on or off. And this happened already in Canada and in Germany in 2021 and 22. And uh, it will be far more prevalent when we are on a CBDC, which is actually not money, but a total control uh, coin or a means of control. Um, okay, what was planned here uh, in the USSR command economy from 1932 onwards, collectivization, forced social rules, check, we see that in uh, you, the EU as well, central planning of industry, the CBDC has that central planning like in the Netherlands, uh, where the um, central bank of the Netherlands, uh, well, makes hints at this all the time, actually. Uh, private sector and foreign concessions, planning through the ESG rules, perhaps, labor and wages control in the Soviet Union. Well, um, this was uh, given up in uh, 1891, the law of the unbreakable wages in Belgium, for example, where you couldn't pay people in other things than uh, money. Uh, so they will change those laws, uh, for example, and they will uh, make them be overruled by European laws that allow to be paid in that fake euro, digital euro coin. Monetary circulation control, all coming taxation, finance and price control, credit systems. Uh, they had a de facto social credit system through the local Soviet representation in the USSR and in every municipality and company, actually. So when you were a good worker, people knew. When you were someone who often criticized the leadership, they also knew. And there was a, well sort of social check and social credit system. If you wanted, uh, as such a worker who had a bad standing or where people knew he gave a lot of uh, critiques to the uh, regime, if you wanted to take out a loan from that local uh, Ghost Bank branch, then, yeah, surely it got rejected. Uh, foreign trade control and transmission protection mechanisms. So this is all going on. And we see so many parallels, it's not even funny. Uh, it's actually just copy-paste. Uh, they often rename things. Uh, they will, of course, uh, not use the word Soviet uh, in, in such uh, plans. But other than that, it's usually a copy-paste of what uh, was there before. Some closing thoughts. And the Sperbank is the leftover bank from the Gosbank, and it was sponsor of the World Economic Forum in uh, 2022. So the original Bolsheviks, and especially Lenin, wanted to state structure that was completely separated from their own political party structure once things were set up. Um, yeah, we know that that didn't uh, meet expectations. <laughs> we know how it ended. But uh, that was a plan, and it was actually not a bad plan. If you have a state structure completely separated from their own political party structure, it's uh, maybe more healthy than what they eventually got. Uh, the same can be said in another context, of course, of the European Union, where the political structure and voting is more and more alienated from the ECB's policies and operations, uh, controlled by non-elected people and groups or lobbyists or uh, rejects from local politics and so on. So this uh, this is actually uh, a, a quite sick system uh, if they keep going on like that. It's not separated at all. Uh, meeting the plan's goal is far more important, like in the USSR, than the efficiency and uh, even rewarding uh, damaging policies um, is exceptional is acceptable in uh, such a realm. So um, yeah, if 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 the theoretical meeting of your plans is more important than actually uh, having happy citizens and a good society, then it's quite dangerous and, uh, to be honest, uh, totalitarian. The ECB is rapidly getting to a total control approach about money and their evolution from a national currency over the EQ uh, to the euro to the CBDC is going on. And we are right here right now. So first we had these national currencies who changed form a few times, uh, certainly during the wartime. 
And then we have the EQ, uh, which was actually a, a means of having a pre-euro sort of coin within uh, the realms of between nations and payments and banks. And then the banks implemented it. Then the larger corporations started also to implement the euro. And then the citizens got the euro. And now we have uh, the next phase, the CBDC. So they moved from national currencies towards a total control coin with a few steps in between. And this will bring the same sort of unworkable centralized series of problems with permission coins and soft totalitarianism into the eurozone and its money supply. Uh, the same issues, more or less, than what the USSR uh, introduced with such mono bank approach like the Gos Bank. So they will run into the same problems, only it will be faster, it will be more modern, and of course it will be marketed uh, quite differently, of course. The ECB is actually rewriting history as well, telling everyone a monobank CBDC and their ESG policies, policies are new and more advanced and we look forward to the future and so on, while it is the same old trick they do over and over and over again, repackaging the same Soviet-style stuff and put it in a more modern technological box and sell it to us uh, through very clever marketing um, and their central nature is just evil and dangerous. Uh, the USSR went down for many reasons, of course, not only for their fiat system or the Gosbank, bank, uh, corruption, inefficiency, the shift from rural to city of a large part of the population, but also by the blockades of the West. But uh, fortunately, Bitcoiners are not confined to such um borders and territory so we as bitcoiners have a um, freedom coin or a coin that can be used anywhere in the world and we are not bound to a territory and this is um, very important as we have first time in history a coin or a, a means of having value for ourselves and not tied to a territory or a printing press somewhere or a, a bank. The ECB, in my opinion, has become more and more a sort of reworked version of the Gas Bank, only with a faster, modern, more modern technology and a very non-ideological series of top politicians or hired guns framing the follow the plans ideal. Um, this allows them to copy the view on macroeconomics of the layer 2 system in the USSR Gos Bank system while solving the practical layer 2 control problems. Uh, meaning, yeah, they replaced it with a nice app where you can scan a QR code, but in essence, they are uh, the masters of um, this system and can control if your QR code still will work and your value is still there or not. According to me, some top people within the circle of uh, power in the uh, EU adopted and adapted the old Soviet ideas, reworked them, renamed them, and made them into new policies to work with more modern technology, but with the same end goal. The path necessary to follow leads us to a global oversight coordinated by democratic international structure under the auspices of the United Nations. Do this before it gets out of hand. This is a quote from Paul de Grauwe uh, in uh, De Tat, uh, a magazine in Belgium, in uh, 2021. Um, he's from the uh, Institut Rousseau and has some, let's say, command economic views. And uh, it's really clear what he wants to do here. Um, so he wants to have a, a, so, a sort of total control coin. And uh, of course, uh, no surprise there, he's against Bitcoin and uh, he's, um, he's really in favor of what the EU is doing at the moment. In this new era, uh, and this is a quote from Christian, Christine Lagarde, um, in this new era, a digital euro would guarantee that citizens in the euro area can maintain costless act access to a simple, universally accepted, safe and trusted means of, of payment. The digital euro would still be a euro, like banknotes, but digital. It would be an electronic form of money issued by the euro system, the ECB and national central banks, and accessible to all citizens and firms. Our work aims to ensure that in the digital age, citizens and firms continue to have access to the safest form of money, central bank money. This is, of course, laughable and uh, a big, big lie in almost every sentence she speaks here. Um, 
it will not guarantee that citizens in the euro can maintain costless active payment because yeah they turn some citizens off <laughs> or their bank accounts or their their uh, or they put limits on it so it's 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 not a guarantee at all it's the opposite um the digital world would still be a euro no uh, it lost its uh, uh, properties so it's not a euro anymore it's not even money anymore and our work aims to ensure uh in the digital age, citizens and firms continue to have access. This is this is uh, ridiculous, actually. So this shows you what kind of marketing they uh, they keep firing uh, upon their citizens to sell a very old uh, USSR like system. Then we have um, even further down the rabbit hole, we can think of the MCBDC bridges as a means to expand the layer one Ghost Bank to the whole world, in effect, uh, creating a one world total control coin. Um, and then when a green industrial revolution happens in Europe, it can confine our energy production to this continent, while at the same time incorporating the new economic policies of the Bolsheviks in a more modern manner, while restricting old freedoms, controlling our layer two money, and getting people to obey to their total money control policies. Uh, Bitcoin stands between this uh, reality and the China light we've seen being developed around us. Um, here we have a, a photo of a few um, communist socialist and one Belgian nationalist who, well, I don't know what she's doing there, but okay, whatever. And um, here we have uh, the early crew of uh, Vladimir Lenin. It's actually... Um, more than 100 years apart, but they clearly have the same goals or something. I don't know. It's it's strange to see these uh, historic events repeat. These are some links for uh, people who want uh, further reading on this subject. Thank you all for attending this uh, webinar about the ECB and the Gosbank. Thank you.